you and welcome everyone to Monday, Money Mondays with Melissa. Every Monday, every month on Money Mondays, we make space for conversations with city leaders. We talk to people who can help with finance questions that we all have, like managing money, saving for the future, and, and saving for our home and paying for our home. So one of the most popular conversations that we've had is around paying for college. And I'm sure you can guess why. It's not easy. At University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where I went to school, tuition alone these days is nearly $11,000 a year. And that does not include fees or room and board. Even if you're going to a community college, it's not cheap. The average cost of in-state community college is $4,000 a year. There's a lot of advice to save money for kids' college educations starting from the time they're born. But what if you or your parents weren't in the position to do that? The good news is that college is not out of reach. There are many ways to pay for college that involve scholarships, grants, and low income, low interest loans. But those aren't the only considerations as you get ready for college. Keep that in mind. College presents a whole new social and emotional world that you need to be prepared for as well. So today, those so, so today we have a phenomenal panel who can tell us about all the ways in which you need to prepare so you can make an incredible start on your college career. So please welcome Maria Busio, Director of Post-Secondary Pathways for Chicago Public Schools. Welcome, Maria. Abel Montoya, Director of Outreach Operations, Illinois Student Assistance Commission, and Annette Houston Johnson, Clinical Assist Associate Professor for the Jane Addams College of Social Work, the University of Illinois at Chicago. A phenomenal panel, panel, list of panelists. So thank you for all being here today. So I know we have some eager parents and students watching so let's get right to it. To help us moderate, so with that, I will be the moderator. And, and with that, I am happy to have the great panel here. And so we'll talk about where we want to focus. So with that, I'd like to just start round robin discussions and to learn a bit more about you. So I'll start with Ms. Busio. So can you just tell us a little bit about your work and how you can help students plan for the top for the future of college. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today in my role as director of post secondary pathways at Chicago Public Schools Office for School Counseling Post Secondary Advising. I work with a team of educators who are committed to helping students figure out their next step for life after high school. And one initiative that we currently work on is something called Learn, Plan, Succeed. Learn, Plan, Succeed is a commitment from Chicago Public Schools to support every student in figuring out a plan, developing a plan for life after high school. And we start doing this work in the sixth grade and it culminates in the 12th grade. Thank you. And so we'll go to Mr. Montoya. Uh, thank you for having me here today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Myself as a first generation college student, I, I know how overwhelming this process could be for, for many people, parents and students included. Uh, my role at the Illinois Student Assistance Commission, which is a state agency whose mission statement is to provide Illinois students with assistance and, and, uh, and information to help make education beyond high school possible and accessible. My role is to go out into the community uh, across the state of Illinois and to assist families with this process, to ease those fears, uh, answer any questions they may have, so the concerns could be addressed, uh, so we can make whatever plans they may have possible for them. So once again, it's a pleasure to be here. Ms. Johnson?
Good, good afternoon. First of all, let me thank Treasurer Kanyas Irvin in her absence and Chief Scott for inviting me today. Um, I am Annette Johnson and I'm a professor at the Jane Addams College of Social Work at the University of Illinois. Jane Addams is a graduate program, so the students that I work with have completed their undergraduate degree. But I have a I always had a strong commitment to, to working with youth having worked with them throughout my career. So my community social impact focus really centers around mentoring youth or in, entering college. I in, initiated a mentoring program with my college alumni chapter that mentors freshmen in college, and we follow them for all four years. So your freshman year of college is so critical and I'm so happy to be able to have this conversation today. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. So let's get right to the questions um, to the, for our discussion. So Mr. Montoyo, how can Illinois, how can the Illinois Student Assistance Commission help students and families prepare for paying for college? Sure. So what we do, um, our division is the outreach division. So we go out in the communities, as I mentioned, and help families uh, address the process of going to college. And what we do is we hire recent college graduates that we call ISAC core members that grew up in those communities or study in those communities. So they're familiar with the communities and we place them throughout the state. And their role is they go visit the schools, community-based organizations, whether it be a church, after school program, whatever it may be, and do presentations uh, and everything from uh, looking into careers to filling out a financial aid application and understand how the financial aid process works. So we, in conjunction with our partners, host financial aid presentations. We also hold workshops on submitting the college application or in many cases, filling out that financial aid application that could be a little bit complicated for many. And in addition to those group settings, we also meet with families one-on-one. -on -one whether it's in person, whether it's over the phone, whether it's email, to address any specific questions they may have. Because from our perspective, the first step is asking the question, what is it that you have concerns about? Or where do you not know the answer to? And we can start there and we'll take from this. So that's how we work with the families uh, to get them to where they need to be or where to which they wish to be. Phenomenal. So Ms. So Ms. Johnson, college is a wonderful time of life when young people are getting more freedom than perhaps they've been accustomed to and additional responsibilities. Can you talk about what makes a college student ready to take on those freedoms and now additional responsibilities called college? Yeah, yeah, college is really a wonderful time for young people and it's a time for new found freedoms. But with that freedom come responsibilities which also can be stressful and anxiety provoking for young people. The young people are excited to be independent away from their parents, but also anxious because of the kinds of plans and decisions that they have to make. So in order to be prepared for college, I really think it's important to have the following kind of skill sets. You really need good time management skills. You need good study skills. You need good money management skills. But in addition to those skills, you must have also what I, we call social emotional skills. So when we think of social emotional skills, those are the soft skills that can help you be really successful in college. And in corporate America, those are the skills that they look for in employees. So when we talk about those skill sets, you really need to know yourself, be aware of your strengths and areas that are challenges for you. I don't wanna say weaknesses, but areas that you need to work on for further. You need to have confidence in your own abilities. Be able to build and maintain good relationships. For some young people, being able to get along with your roommate. Some folks have not lived, had a roommate or they've had uh, sisters or brothers, but that was a kind of a different relationships. So being able to get along with folks that you're gonna have to be really in close contact with, being able to get along with dorm mates. Uh, being able to work in teams, and that is so important that many times some, some young people really prefer to work by themselves, but it's important to be able to work in collaborative teams. And finally, good decision-making skills, uh, particularly in terms of keeping safe and avoiding risky kinds of behaviors. 
Oh, excellent, excellent, excellent. I, I wish I had some of this when I went to school just a few years ago. So with that, Ms. Ms. Busio, you help set students on the right path to college. So with that, what are some of the ways in which students are not often prepared as they could be? And now with the stress that we have today on the panelists, how can we get our students more prepared? Thank you for that question. Two things come to mind as I think about the work that we do. Um, and the things that do come to mind are study habits and self-awareness. So let me talk a little bit about what I mean by that. In terms of the study habits, oftentimes our students are, are used to maybe putting in one, two hours a day of studies and getting some decent grades in high school. When they get to college, that's not necessarily the case. There not, never seems to be enough hours in a day. And I think that Annette Johnson alludes to this. Uh, the, the study habits that our students have, um, this idea of cramming the night before a big exam or a big project isn't gonna work. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that oftentimes when we get to meet with our alumni who are coming back to talk to our students in high schools, these are the kinds of things that they talk about, really taking some time to start to learn how to break things up and, to, and really what they're talking about is study habits. The other thing that comes to mind is self-awareness. And so this idea about being in touch with one's own values, zooming into those things that are most important to each of us. And it could be community, it could be health, it could be education, it could be a number of things. And so allowing ourselves as students um, to, to be able to tune into what those things that are most important to us might be. I think that leads to the things that Annette Johnson was talking about, which is confidence and sound decision-making and the ability to build stronger relationships and even helps with the communication and being able to express what is most important to us and why we do the things that we do. Um, in terms of recommendations, I would say it's okay to ask for help. I think that's one thing that many young people struggle with. It's okay to ask for help. College is a, is, it's a journey and it was never, it is never intended as a journey that you must do on your own. So ask for help. Um, there are lots of caring adults and that asking for help could happen at home with the adults that you most trust. It can happen in your high schools with your counselors and your teachers and your mentors. And it can also happen on campus. There's this thing called student support services that many of our students oftentimes don't discover until later in their college career. Just remember beyond admissions and financial aid, there's lots of support services on campus. And then the last thing I, I will share in terms of a recommendation is to make the most out of your high school years. Um, this is when you can get involved and start to figure out what you really like and don't like. Seek out tutoring, uh, talk to your teachers, take the career interest profilers and those personality assessments that we put out to you guys. Here at Chicago Public Schools, we use a system called Naviance. Um, and those profiles that, that we put out can help get a read for our students beyond what they can see for themselves. Um, and those adults in the schools can help the students figure out what that means. And it puts a student in a, in a better place, in a, a better position to start thinking about their future. Excellent information. So just as you heard earlier, the what you see is information that's being shared with you. So we will share those links. We make them available after we, we have our panel discussion today. So, so and we'll give you the website to go to. So I'm going to talk, let's talk more about finance, Mr. Montoya. So there are a lot of families, even if they are able to secure some scholarship or grant funding, will also need loans to pay for school. So what are some of the best practices for using loans to pay for college without saddling students with a tremendous amount of debt when they graduate? That's a great question. And actually, if, if I may, I'd like to digress just slightly about the scholarship piece. And what happens um, that I've seen over the years is that students are very, you know, excited and enthusiastic about applying for scholarships their senior year in high school, but once they enroll in college, they stop looking for scholarships. We need to remind them that scholarships are there for also continuing students. So never stop after high school, keep going and searching for those scholarships. And the other piece of advice for scholarships is to look locally, look in your community, look at, look at the businesses, maybe where you went and spent some money um, and ask them, do you have a scholarship available? You'd be surprised how many organizations have those scholarships. 
And the reason I say look locally is because it's a smaller applicant pool. So you're more likely to get it versus say a national scholarship where you're competing against everyone across the country. CPS does an outstanding job of amassing scholarships available to their students. Uh, I believe it's through Naviance or they have their own website. So working in conjunction with the support team at CPS about uh, the scholarship of, uh, searches, opportunities that they may have is really key because sometimes even some schools may have their own scholarships donated by alumni from the school for students graduate from that particular high school. So, so don't, um, don't forget to keep on looking for scholarships, not to the question that at hand, which is, you know, what's the philosophy for borrowing money? My philosophy is only borrow what you need and no more. That's mm -hmm. it, only borrow what you need and no more because loans are not, student loans are not gonna be dischargeable in bankruptcy. You're gonna have to pay them, okay? Whether it's the student, or whether it's the parent. And the parent, that's even a separate question. I'll touch briefly, if, if I may. Uh, with student loans, there's a limit as to how much each student can borrow from the Department of Education, from the federal student aid, all right? First year is $5,500, the second year is $6,500, and third year and beyond is $7,500. If you add that up, we're talking about $30,000 total if you go to a four-year institution. If you go to another institution, you know, a two-year institution, it could be less if they take money out. But you got to keep that, that total number in mind because you have to think about what, what's the salary that my position or title will, will command? Um, and will that be enough for me to, to pay rent, utilities, buy food, and still make my student loan payment, all right? Um, because we'll figure it out later, that type of philosophy ends, in, ends up in disaster, okay? As much pre-planned as possible is the best. And if you go outside the federal student aid for student loans, please, please be very careful because the interest rates could be variable, which means they go up and down depending on each year. They may um, ask for a co-signer. Uh, I mean, they have, they're not as, as forgiving if, if you run into difficulties with your finances after college or once you leave school. And that's the other thing too. If you take out loans and don't graduate from college, you stop out you're still responsible for those loans. So it's very important that you persist and graduate to get that credential. And for the parents, if your parents take out a PLUS loan, you as a parent is, are responsible for that loan. So please proceed with caution, because I said, those are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. So like, say you're a little closer to retirement, like I, I may be in a few years, I think twice about borrowing extra money for my kid to go to college, because that may put off my retirement down the road. If you have other children, what does that mean for other children? So back to my philosophy, only borrow what you need and no more and pay attention to the details associated with those loans. My goodness, thank, wish I'd some, again, someone had told me this earlier. <laughs> so Ms. Johnson, we're gonna talk, we're gonna go, go to you. Most people think of college as being a fun time because of the newfound freedom as you, as you mentioned earlier. But a lot of young people, if it's an incredible, stressful time because they're struggling to work jobs and they're helping with siblings if they're at home they just still have to pay the bills which can make it hard to keep up their grades what is your advice to students who are having a very stressful time managing college or anticipating what their work experience would be you know and as of late we talk about the new norm because due to the pandemic related issues, what can, what advice do you have? You know, um, I, I, I agree that I think that this is really an important discussion. College can be very stressful for young people. Um, uh, so as a college student, if you're on campus, you're in a new environment without your parents, even though you're excited about that, you, you, you uh, will find that that guidance and support has always been very important to you. So you really are making independent decisions. Um, so although there's a lot of excitement about being uh, having the opportunity to be in, independent, there's also some stress and anxiety that's associated with it. So one of the things is really having a sense of what the stresses are for you and looking for ways to manage those stresses are so important. Um, you know, I often uh, talk about COVID as being a new normal for us. So many times you might be going to college with some lingering kind of trauma experiences from COVID. So just be aware of what those are. 
But the most important thing is to seek assistance. And I think that was mentioned earlier, be willing to ask for help. And many times our college students know they need help, but feel that they, this is a time when they should be able to show that they can do it on your own and you don't have to. So you start by talking with somebody about the issues of concerns and certainly, you know, many times young people start with friends, but you also have to think about the teachers and faculty there. You know, if you're not clear about the course or the assignment, be sure to request a meeting with your, 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 your instructor. Uh, particularly if you're in large classes, um, it's really important that the instructor gets to know you, kind of know what your learning needs are and how you learn best. That's really important. Then there are the residents, uh, house staff who are really good resources and can be supports. But then the most important places that people tend not to go to is the college tutoring center and the college counseling center. And those are there on campus uh, for it to, to provide really support for you. So if you have an academic problem, use that service. And if you're having some social and emotional problems, go to the counseling center. You know, it's, it's okay. Uh, and that's what they are there for. So I think it's really important um, that you think about what your needs are. So you were a student who were getting support in high school from your school social worker, your school, school counselor, or if you have a disability, look for ways to mirror that support in college. Uh, often, I work with graduate students. So these are students who have completed college and they are in a graduate program. And often they will come in to me uh, at, when they begin to struggle and, and say, and I learned that they have a disability. So I say, have you asked for accommodations? And students more than once, many times will say to me, well, when I got accepted in, into graduate school, I thought that meant I didn't need accommodations. So they saw graduate uh, school acceptance as you know, giving them free range to not need accommodations. But if you have a disability or learning disability, you might need that support. So be sure that if you are needing support in college, I mean, in high school, to look for ways to mirror that support when you get to college campuses and those supports are there. If I may add one other, other location would be the financial aid office. For individuals or families whose financial situation changed drastically because maybe of COVID, they lost their job or something happened, they need to let the financial aid office know right away so that they could work with them to consider their special circumstance to see if there's some emergency funds available for them. Or if the students like in high school and everything was already set and they're gonna enroll this fall and something happened with their finances changed drastically, let the financial aid office know so they can redo that award letter so they don't have that added, uh, added stressor of finances on top of everything mm -hmm. else. So always mm -hmm. communicate. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mr. Montoya, since it's summertime now, and you know, as students get ready for starting school in August or in September, are the offices open now in, in the colleges and universities or, or even Ms. Busio in CPS? If they have some additional questions, are, are you, how accessible are the counselors right now? From our part, it's yes, the financial aid officers are open. I'll, I'll defer to Ms. Pusey for the rest. Yes, we are open. In fact, every, every high school throughout Chicago Public Schools has at least one person that is assigned to working on all things post-secondary. And a lot of what they do is really helping students and families figure out the next step particularly when the, their first choice option is not working out for them and they need to shift their plans. So yes, we, we are open and we do have emergency funds for families who are struggling at the moment. Fantastic. So Ms. Lucio, I'll, I'll stay with you. What do students tell you when they're worried about when it comes to the social and emotional aspects of going to college. You know, we've talked about some of the preparation, but now they're ready to go and they're ready to take off. What are they saying? Number now, one is it's the financial strains. Uh, everything that Abel Montoya just talked about. Uh, oftentimes when our families have really worked towards getting a student into a particular college and then they come to a point where they realize their financial abilities just do not, are not conducive towards that. That is where a lot of that emotional burden and anxiety starts to happen for our students. 
Um, so one of the things that we tend to work on is ensuring that students have more than one option to consider and that they're preparing for more than one option to try to reduce some of that stress. The other thing that often comes up in our discussions with students is fitting in. Um, it's a fitting in, making friends, being judged, feeling alone. And this particularly happens in the one discussion that often comes up has to do with diversity and it comes from students that are typically getting ready to leave Chicago. For many of our students, this is the first time they're leaving their home. This is the first time they're leaving their communities. Uh, and so that, that is a stressor. Um, for many of our students who are the first to go to college, the first in their community sometimes to experience college, I think part of what, what we're talking about is the fear of the unknown. Um, so what will be my next step? Um, the uncertainty of what the next challenge may be and how they will address it. And then this idea that they're gonna do it on their own because they don't wanna burden their families and others who care for them. Um, and again, I wanna reemphasize that college is never intended to be a journey that is done alone. This is something that others can help with. Um, it's really important that students do, do reach out and ask for help. Um, Again, financial aid offices, the admission office, those are the ones where students typically have established some kind of relationship before they leave our high schools. But making use of the tutoring centers, particularly for our students who maybe are not um, doing as well as they thought they were gonna do with the math and the science and the writing, um, making sure that they become aware of the wellness center. Uh, wellness center is probably one of those spaces that's very much underutilized um, and then these days, we also have a lot of spaces within our campuses uh, that are dedicated to addressing food insecurity. So again, taking inventory of those things that are making it difficult for them to, to move forward and seeing what's available within their campuses. Um, and then also reaching out back to us. Uh, we typically do uh, work, very intentional work with our alumni, students who have graduated from our high schools, particularly during the, during the spring breaks, the winter breaks, the summer breaks. Um, so that it's always, we know that the students are coming back into town or they're coming back home into their communities and we're there, we're available. So tap into the high school. Uh, that's one good place to start. So with that, uh, Ms. Johnson, do you have anything to add to this discussion around the social emotional wellness? You know, I think we've kind of covered Great. The, the big picture. And I think we, we've, uh, what Ms. Bushi had said really reinforces my thoughts too. Oh, so with that, let's, let's move on. So a quick reminder uh, to our audience is to submit any, your, any of your questions for our panelists in the Q&A or the chat room. And we'll get into those in just a few minutes. So, Mr. Montoya, let's come back to you for a moment. And so, as mentioned, it's it's great to for everyone to be saving for the college experience. And so, from from the day the child is born, but there are a lot of folks who are out there. You know, that's that's not that's just not in the plans. So, I'm wondering. What can you say to the expected parents or parents of very young children who really don't have a lot of disposable income? Does it make sense to put money away such as $25 a month for college? It would be an emphatic yes, absolutely. Uh, and the reason being is uh, sometimes it's not really the amount, but the message that you're sending. When you have a fund specifically set aside for your child to go to college, you're, you're setting expectations of the, of the student. They are, it's being ingrained in them that they will go beyond high school, whatever that may look like, whether it's a certificate, vocational, associate degree, four-year degree, whatever it may be, they're going beyond high school. So if you start you know, uh, talking to them about this and telling them that there's going to be some support, that you're preparing for it they'll start preparing for it too. They have a different mindset when it comes to uh, the, the classroom and the activities. And even if it's $25 a month, but that's $300 a year. If you save and save for 10 years with no interest earned, you know, we're talking $3,000. That's a nice little scholarship that you just gave yourself. Okay, that you, you compound the interest and becomes even a bigger amount of money, which means that Either the student would borrow less, maybe the parents take out less in loans. That means maybe they have more financial options uh, in regards to colleges that are financially viable for them. 
So it makes a big difference. Uh, and there's something called 529 plans. 529 plans are educational savings plans that grow, uh, the interest grows tax-free. And they're set specifically for college. Um, and each state has their own plans. In Illinois, there's a, there's a couple right starts and right directions. Um, and you don't have to be the parent to start that plan. You could be an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, a godparent, a neighbor, a really good friend. You know, you can pretty much start them for, for anybody. So when you have those birthday parties, maybe you throw some half the money they may get into that 529 plan or whatever educational savings plan you may have, uh, because every little bit adds up. Okay. Um, but like I said, for me, the most important thing is that you're sending a message to your child of the expectations you have for them. And I think that's, that's such a positive thing to do um, for everybody involved, for the student, the parents, and even the friends of the students, because they'll talk about this amongst themselves. And we know that kids have a tendency to listen to other kids more than they listen to their own parents. At least, at least that's the case with me. So, so yes, it, it's a good idea. So let's, so, so around college preparedness, um, Ms. Busio, there are a lot of students who go to college feeling unclear about what they want to study and or even after graduation and they're you know they, they they're trying to figure all this out how this works with with my life and there's certainly a source of stress for some what is your advice to students who don't really have a clear path figured out as of yet it's okay to not know uh, a lot of our students will, will start college and somewhere along the process in this journey, they're going to change their mind. Even those that are thinking, yes, I am going to be a doctor. I am going to be a teacher. I am going to be, at some point in the process of going through college and everything that you experience, students tend to change their mind. So it is okay to not know. The other thing I wanna mention there is that when you are the first to go to college in your family, it's really hard to know because you don't know what's available. You don't know what's out there. So really college is about exploring oneself in, in many regards. I do recommend, however, that students truly take some time to consider their likes and their dislikes because that's where the decision is gonna stem from. What is it that they value? What is it that they want? What is it that they like? And what is it that they don't like? And I think that many of our students can clearly say, I just don't like math or I don't like things where I have to read every single night. There are some elements of knowing what they like and don't like that can start to steer them in the different directions where they will eventually land on a program of study. Other things to consider is um, when the student is looking at a college, look at the programs of study. If you were to start something and then change your mind, is there something else within that college that is of interest? And if not, that means that the student will likely have to transfer. So those are things to consider as they're looking at colleges and as they're looking at the programs of study. If there's something in there that they really like, but there's nothing else as a backup, then maybe that's not the right college for them. Maybe they wanna pick a college that has a variety of options that align with the interests of the students. And with that comes not only looking at the programs of study, but looking at a timeline. When might be a good time to, to transfer, for example, also look at the job prospects. Abel Montoya spoke to this earlier today. What are the job prospects? Am I willing to move and to relocate? Where will the jobs be for a person that has the skills and the, the, the credentials that I'm going to earn? And so looking at job prospects is also a big thing. Even within the state, even assuming that, you, that the student would stay within the state of Illinois, does that mean that they're gonna have to move into a city, into a rural area to think about those things? Um, and then the other thing to mention here is that there's a lot to consider. College is an investment of time, money, and energy. And so once they get onto campus, be sure to not miss classes, get involved, meet people, use the resources, and seek experiences. If our students are going to college, going to work, coming home, they're missing out on so much that they can be gaining from the experience of being a college student. Thank you, thank you very much, Ms. Lucio. So, Ms. Johnson, based upon what you've heard, and, and from an, again, from your purview and your talk, and you and, and what you have, and you talked somewhat about this earlier, when you talk about uh, the additional services that are available to students, there are so many situations that young people might experience 
at college, especially if they're going away to school from home that they may not have experience with from an academic standpoint, from a social standpoint, and from a financial standpoint. And some of the decisions that you, know, you have to make can be pretty high stakes, especially at an early age. Mm -hmm. and you're setting the course for your future. And how do you advise students to navigate those uncharted waters? And oftentimes, and you talked about having confidence or confidants earlier, mm -hmm. how do we manage, students manage all that? Well, you know, decision-making uh, is so important in life, but particularly in college. There's an old adage to say, start the way you want to end. So. Um, I always say to students, when you go to college, you want to end with a college degree. So you have to really begin to think of that early on. So as a freshman, it's very, very critical that you um, take it really slowly. And I say that um, for a couple of reasons. One, you need to really take time to understand the academic expectation. What's the academic rigor that's expected here? And no matter what kind of student you were in college, in high school, I can tell you uh, that the expectations are going to be two or three times higher. So you have to really adjust to that academic rigor. The second thing that I will say and say over and over again, from my experience as a mentor, manage your degree of involvement in social activities. Yes, college, there are all kinds of social activities that you can be involved with. But for that first semester, perhaps that first year, you really wanna manage that. Um, for example, there might be a party every night that your friends are encouraging you to, to attend, but can you do that and be successful academically? I would say no. Uh, so really being aware of what you can manage and figure out in your time management schedule when you can plug in some time for socialization. College should be that, but it can't become your life if you want that goal of a college degree at the end. The other thing that I mentioned touched on early, but I wanna go back to now is keeping safe and avoiding risky behavior. Uh, and there are all kinds of risky behavior in college. And uh, so what I say to young people, if you, if you don't know what to do, just think of what would my mother say? What would my mother want? And that might help gauge you no, I don't want to do this, uh, get involved with this activity. And, I, and I'll share with you, it's really real. I have two young uh, people that I've mentored that were sent home because of engaging in risky behavior. Uh, they were able to rebound from it. They, are, they both went on to get college degrees and are very successful, but it could have been um, a, a stop for them. Uh, I encourage you to... Um, to think about this in terms of decision-making. And if you have not read the story of the poster child, the Kimber Smith story, I encourage you to do it. I encourage each parent and each student to either get this book and read it or Google the Kimber Smith story online because she tells her story of being involved in risky behavior and being sentenced to 24 and a half years in prison and was uh, what was released because of uh, President Clinton who, uh, who uh, uh, gave her a re release. But the point is she tells her story now because she wants other young people to learn from her decision. That could have been a life-changing decision uh, had she not gotten early release. Uh, so I want you to just Google and read her story. It's compelling and I grant you it would help you think about the kinds of decisions you make in college. So again, college is about growing, developing, having fun, socializing, meeting lifelong friends, uh, but it's also about making sure that you end your four years with a college degree. Fantastic, great information. But we also know that um, the four-year institution or the two-year institution is not always the most viable choice for individuals. So there's the vocational route as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I'll, I'll ask Mr. Montoya or Ms. Ms. Busio, when you have college students who are considering 
uh, the alternative route. Is there financial assistance available? Or in, in your, from a CPS standpoint, what do you advise students if they're not college ready yet, but it's time to graduate? That's a good question. Um, when I talk to, to families, I tell them there's no one path that's right for everybody, but each person will have a, a path that's right for themselves. All right, so it's just a matter of figuring out what is my path. If someone's path is a career and vocational program, uh, that's great. What I tell them to do is I tell them to start with the commu local community college to see if they offer something similar or something that's in line with what they want to do, because they often also have those certificate programs or vocational programs, and they're at a reduced cost. When you go into some of the proprietary schools, it could be much more expensive. And then you have to be cognizant of how much will this cost me by borrowing extra money from a different source, like the college itself or other places. So you you got to look at your at your options. Um, but I would say start locally with the local community college to see if they offer something that's that meets your needs. And usually it's much more affordable. And financial aid, well, community colleges will take it from the state and will take it from the federal government. So usually there's a little bit more of the free money uh, through the community colleges. Yes, and I will add to that. I, I think community colleges are, are always a fantastic option. I think a lot of people don't know that they do offer certificate programs, but they also offer apprenticeship programs. And for those students who are not familiar with apprenticeship programs, it's where you get to work and learn and get paid while you're doing all of that. Um, there's also military programs. Uh, so the military pathway, for example, oftentimes our students choose to go directly to military, come back and use the benefits that they earn while they're there. But we also have another group of really savvy students who start college while getting the benefits of military. And when they enter the military, they come in at a much higher uh, level or rank because they already have some credits under their belt. Um, beyond that, there's uh, job training programs. There are um, there's even service year programs that a lot of times allow the students to give back to their communities and to start to explore who they are and what they're about and then kind of zone into what it is that they're really passionate about and what they're really interested in and then that, that informs um, their, their journey into what their next step will be and it could be college and it could be something else. There's lots and lots of options. One place to start is your, your school counseling office. That is definitely the place to start. All right, fantastic. So um, now we have time for just a few questions from our attendees. So do we have any questions um, from the attendees? There was a question in the chat uh, that asked, uh, please share info on college students who are having a hard time meeting the financial obligations and specifically if there are any grants. Um, I go back to my statement earlier about staying in touch with the financial aid office and, and, and if there's some exchange circumstances, make sure that that information is conveyed uh, to the financial aid office to see if there's some additional funds through university itself, okay? The other piece is that some people, uh, some families don't, uh, aren't, don't realize that there are payment plans. So you don't have to pay the full year or the full semester at the beginning. You can set it up to pay, make it in installments. And sometimes that makes things a little bit more palatable. Uh, in regards to grants themselves, those are usually the first things to go. So very rarely will there be additional grants unless it's like some type of emergency grant for the university. So that's, we go back to talking to the financial aid office. And for me, this, this all beckons back to that senior year in high school, that when you're making the decision to where to attend and you're looking at all the financial aid offers, that decision is so critical, so key, because this is where you extrapolate the cost for the next two years or four years, whatever length of program it will be, to see if you'll be able to meet your financial obligations, to see if the college gave you enough financial assistance so you could afford that institution. When there's a, a gap between what it costs and what financial aid they have and what they can afford, that gap has got to be filled somehow. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I've seen too many families say, well, just figure it out. Don't figure it out. Extra money doesn't show up miraculously. Um, so that decision at the end of senior year is so important. And that's also where you can talk to colleges to see if they have any additional funds to maybe get, eliminate that gap. Um, so they, that college is more doable because if you can extrapolate those costs mm -hmm. and then at the end of senior year, you know exactly how much it's gonna cost you when you go to roll in college, then that's one less thing you have to worry about. How am I gonna pay my bills? Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise if you go to college, you can't afford and you, you owe them money and you don't pay that money back, you become financially encumbered. The college will then will not release your transcript until you pay what you owe, which means that may prevent you from enrolling in another institution 
because that other institution will want your transcript from the, uh, from the prior institution. So it becomes really, really messy. So we go back to being proactive and thinking about that senior year in high school. And, and that's why even further back, apply to at least half a dozen colleges. So you have multiple offers so you can make a decision that makes more, the most sense for you. It's always great to be admitted to a lot of places that they all want you. And maybe you can play them off each other every once in a while. I don't know if Ms. Boosie wants to add anything else. Yeah, I, I do want to add a little bit, Abed. Uh, one of the things that we often struggle with is getting our students and our families to complete applications on time. And one application that they really should not delay on is the free application for federal student aid. Oftentimes we call it the FAFSA. For our students who are undocumented, they may be eligible for the alternative application for Illinois financial aid, which is very unique to the state of Illinois. So there are funds out there, but students and families need to complete those applications on time and they do become available October 1st. Um, after that is submitted, there may be questions that come directly from the financial aid offices of the colleges that our students are considering. And it's critically important that students and families respond in a timely fashion. So don't linger on it, don't delay. If they ask for any additional information, they have the ability to ask, they will ask, and it is on the students and families to respond. That will trigger a timely financial aid award letter, which will then detail all the costs, but it will also detail all the help that's available, scholarships, grants, work study, and yes, student loans in some cases. Can I just add to that conversation too? I think it's really so important uh, that after you've done all of those things, and I've seen this often, that you get to summer, this time July, and you don't have a, your, a complete financial aid packet, and you're not really sure where, where that money is coming from. It's really so important to, to really ask that. I've seen students go on campus without, without a complete packet. So that's the first level of stress. You're trying to figure out where the money's come. Mom and dad have gotten you there, but you don't have a complete packet. Work on that packet before leaving home, make sure you know where the monies are and do the ask. I think that we don't do the ask. You ask, you know, I need another $3,000. Where can you help me? And ask the financial aid offices at those campuses. They want you. I, you know, I say this and I work for a college, but college is a business. They want you. They want those numbers. So when you're, you've already committed, they're going to help you find those dollars. But don't go to the campus thinking that it'll work itself out. It will not. Uh, and some colleges will actually do what they call purging. So in that, at some point, if you don't pay all of what's due, they will ask you to leave. Uh, so it's, and then you, you know, you, it's, it's just, and for a first time college uh, student, you don't know all of these details, but it's just so important um, to ask for the money. Don't think it's gonna come to you naturally. It will not, you have to do the ask. And also, if I, if I may, in the chat, I, I put in the link uh, to my field staff. Um, all you have to do is type in your zip code and it tells you who is near you. And they can help you fill out that financial aid application if you haven't done so already. Or if you got selected for verification where they ask for additional documents, they can help you with that process. So we can help you right here and now. Um, just to go to that link, enter your zip code, and, some, and you can get connected with someone. So, uh, Mr. Montoya, uh, Ms. Busio referred to the FAFSA form, and one of the things we know is oftentimes a drawback is the uh, the tax information. They're, they're asking you for your tax return. So, what we know for sure is that if this, don't let that be a barrier, because if you look on uh, this, the website, it this, this for the city of Chicago and even the tre city treasurer's office and it pay, we have an organization that helps you prepare your, your tax returns. So don't let things like that be a barrier in any way in making sure that you get the forms completed and on time. Um, and, and also one of the things we haven't talked about today that are very important and that we're very proud of in the Chicago City Treasurer's Office is that there are internships available so it, to help fill the gap of one, the college experience, two, the financial, uh, to help financially, to make sure that you may take some of that money and use that on college for books, et cetera, in, in, the, go, in the fall or the spring. So use that as opportunity. So that takes having a conversation with your professor 
or the career services offices in, in, your, in your university because that's going to help you be job ready. And that also can be help you with career decisions. So as we try to ensure the city treasurer's office that we are putting out the right information from the financial and emotional standpoint, but, but identify opportunities for yourself, even as a high school student, that you can go and work summer jobs and summer internship opportunities. So they're always available. Um, so there was a question that does it also help with the RISE Act getting into college? Can one of the panelists respond? Yes, and actually, uh, uh, as I mentioned, and um, the or as Maria mentioned, the alternative application for only financial aid is the application that came as a result of the Rise Act. So the Rise Act was the, was the state was the state uh, legislation that did a number of things. One of which made the the state map grant available to uh, to qualified undocumented students, students that graduate from Illinois high school, have GED in Illinois, attended school for at least three years in the K through twelve system. Uh, lived with a guardian or parent in the state of Illinois during those three years, uh, doesn't establish residency outside of Illinois, so basically don't move out of the state. Uh, and if you meet those criteria, you're eligible to apply. And then you apply and the questions mirror the questions on the FAFSA with a few exceptions. And that will determine whether someone's eligible to use the MAP grant, which is the state grant, at any of the community colleges in the state of Illinois, the public universities in Illinois, the not-for-profit colleges in the state of Illinois, and there's like a couple of for-profit schools. So we're talking about 125 or so colleges in the state of Illinois, and yes, we can assist with that. Chief Scott, there's another question that talks about the 504 plan in college. So one of the things that's important to know is that colleges have an Office of Disability Services so any student with a disability, I would encourage parent, parents to be really proactive and have conversations uh, before that child is admitted about what kinds of support your, your young person might need and how that college can support those particular needs. Yes. So that's, that's absolutely right, Ms. Johnson. I, I'm a parent whose child used the 504 plan. So it was very, very helpful, but you have to be aware that that support is available. So Absolutely. yes, so that support is, and, all, and this, this support is available for veterans, individuals with disabilities. So all, most college campuses have those offices that are mm -hmm. just in tune to making sure that your student or you personally succeed. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And so I'm just making sure that from a, any additional questions that are out there. So I don't see any additional questions unless I've missed any, but what we like to do is to, to thank you for all so much for this phenomenal and great discussion for today. And we, we know that uh, the, some of our participants in the audience of many high school students so again, as the, from a Chicago public school standpoint, that this is uh, incredibly important for you to have the conversations now with your counselors, either if you, and even if you go to a private school, have the conversations now so you can make sure that your, your, your college experience will be very, very meaningful. And so now, uh, so with that, so we've had, this has been a great experience and a big, big thanks to our panelists for the wonderful conversation. And again, just to remind you, we'll be sharing the notes and the materials with all of you if you registered via email. So please watch for that. In the meantime, please visit us at www.chicagocitytreasurer.com where you'll always find a full list of our events this week as well as the links to register for future events. And follow us at Chicago City Treasurer on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn to stay on top of the latest. If you have any questions, please reach out to us or my staff at city.treasurer at cityofchicago.org. Again, city.treasurer at cityofchicago.org and we'll get back to you, I promise. Well, 
See you back in September, not, not, not August, we'll be, we're taking a break. So see you back in September for Money Mondays with Melissa. Until then, be safe and thank you for participating.